Okay, so new chapter, chapter five, and uh, major, uh, major new definition, which some of you have seen before because you took uh, differential equations with me. But the definition that I'd like to present is that of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So here's the deal. Let's say let's say we're in the play. We're in R2. And because we're in R2, we can represent eigen we can represent vectors visually. Yeah. Remember that a vector in the plane is just represented as an arrow connecting the origin to the coordinates. So if we're looking at the vector 1, 2, we find the point one, two, and connect it to the origin with an arrow. And now suppose you take a matrix A, a two by two matrix A, and you take this vector one, two, and you multiply it by A. What happens? And the, of course, the answer to that is it depends entirely on the matrix A. Maybe you multiply by this matrix and you wind up there. Or maybe you multiply by this matrix and you wind up there. It all depends on what A is. Ordinarily, multiplying by A is going to change the length of the vector, and it's going to change the direction of the vector. We see that in both of these examples. But it's possible that we'll take this vector, 1, 2, and we'll multiply it by A. And multiplying it by A, we'll scale the vector. It will shrink it or it will cause it to grow, but it won't change the direction. That most recent vector I drew is pointing in the same direction that the original vector was pointing in. And this is the idea behind eigenvectors. So let's make the observation. I used the word scale. Let me now say this explicitly. That if we take 1, 2, and we multiply it by A, and we wind up with that as our new vector, then that matrix multiplication scaled the vector and that matrix multiplication is therefore acting like scalar multiplication. That is to say, suppose A is a square matrix V is a vector 
And the situation we just described is that multiplying the vector v by a is the same as multiplying the vector v by a scalar. And in this particular context, the scalar is always written like that, the Greek letter lambda. If we have this equality, this vector v is called an eigenvector of A, and this scalar lambda is called an eigenvalue. And eigenvalues and eigenvectors are very important tools in all kinds of situations. As I say, some of you have already seen the particular situation where we're in differential equations and trying to classify fixed points using the Jacobian. If you haven't seen that, you will, but this is very important material that has applications outside of linear algebra or outside of what you traditionally construe as linear algebra. So, I suppose before I go any further, I should add a restriction to this. No matter what the matrix A is, and no matter what the number lambda is, it's always true that A times the zero vector equals lambda times the zero vector. We don't want that to be an eigenvector. We don't want to say that zero is an eigenvalue. So we throw in the condition that the eigenvector cannot be the zero vector. Notice that I'm not saying anything about lambda here. The eigenvalue could be zero. That's okay. But an eigenvector is not allowed to be a zero. And I presented this a little backwards of how it's usually used. I said, okay, suppose we have this vector and we have this matrix and multiplying the vector by the matrix is the same as scaling it, then we call the scalar an eigenvalue. It would normally be the other way around. The kind of flowchart of this is that you start with A, you find the eigenvalue or eigenvalues first, and then you find the eigenvectors. So if we wanted write a really formal definition. A scalar 
lambda is an eigenvalue of A if there is a non zero vector V such that A times V equals lambda times V. That's, in general, starting with a matrix and finding its eigenvalues is actually quite difficult. At least if you're working by hand, of course, there are computer algorithms you can run. But in general, going from A to the eigenvalue of A is quite hard. Once you start letting A be bigger than 2 by 2. So that's... Take a look at the easier step first. If you have a matrix A and you somehow have an eigenvalue of A, can you find eigenvectors of A? Let's look at this where A is 3 negative 2, 1, 0, and I will just tell us, never mind for now where this comes from, that lambda equals 2 is an eigenvalue. To find the eigenvector we want to solve A V equals Lambda V. Just because that's the definition of an eigenvalue eigenvector pair. Saying that lambda equals 2 is an eigenvalue and v is an eigenvector is the same as saying that v satisfies this. With the with the additional requirement that V is not allowed to be the zero vector. And this then is just 3, negative 2, 1, 0, times an unknown vector V equals 2 times an unknown vector v. And in spite of my use of the word just there, it's not necessarily at all obvious how to proceed from here. If we didn't have that v on the right, it would be a piece of cake. We just do Gauss-Jordan elimination, but we do. We have a V on the right, and we have a V on the left. 
So let's think of this as a algebra problem, as a college algebra problem, and let's see if our insights transfer. Um, ordinarily, if you're trying to solve an equation and your variable appears twice in the equation, your instinct is probably to try to combine those like terms to get it so that there's just the one variable. Can we do that? Well, we can certainly bring, um, bring everything over to the same side of the equality. That's just addition and subtraction. Eraser. Let's try that again. We've got our matrix times V, and if we are bringing everything to the same side of the equality, we get this. And now, it's in one sense pretty clear from college algebra what we probably want to do. We have a V, it appears twice. We'll just pull that to V out. But that step requires a little comment. Because if you do that naively, you're going to end up with gibberish. If you do this naively, in particular, we would end up with this. And what's that supposed to be? You can't subtract the real number 2, the scalar 2, from a matrix. So that can't quite be right, but it's definitely the right idea. There's just a little trick we need to implement here. And this trick is that V is a matrix. I mean, it's a vector, but vectors are matrices. And we can take any matrix and we can multiply it by the identity matrix I, and it doesn't change anything. Remember that the identity matrix is like the one of matrix multiplication. So if we want to put the identity matrix I in front of V, we can 100% do that. Multiplying V by I doesn't change V. And when we do that, suddenly, Two times I is this. Remember that I has ones down the diagonal. So if you multiply it by two, there are twos down the diagonal. Suddenly, that naive idea we had that we'll just pull the vector v out is no longer ID is no longer naive. It works just fine. If we pull this vector v out.
we wind up with that. And then this we can do this subtraction. Three times two is one, negative three minus two is one, sorry. Negative two minus zero is negative two. One minus zero, zero minus two. And now we have an equation that we can solve using Gauss-Jordan elimination. here in the matrix menu, 2 by 3, and it was, let me remind myself, 1 negative 2, 1 negative 2, we're setting this equal to 0. And we quit out, come back, let's see, reduce row echelon form, go back, and we get infinite solutions, which is a good thing, right? Because Going back to this equation, this is homogeneous. It either has the, only the trivial solution, only v equals zero, or it has infinitely many solutions. And because zero is not an eigenvector, if this thing was going to have eigenvectors, there needed to be non-trivial solutions, which meant there needed to be infinite solutions. Let's get, so 1x minus 2y equals 0. is basic, y is free, we can deal with this the way we've dealt with it before. Hopefully you remember the tricks of writing a solution in parametric form because we're about to use that trick an awful lot. In fact, every time we want eigenvectors. So, if we just use x to store the vector xy, then x equals 2, 1 times y. And there are infinitely many eigenvectors. In fact, any value of y other than zero gives you an eigenvector. So that isn't so bad. I mean, we need, we need that sort of cute little trick. We need to remember to insert the identity matrix i, but otherwise we're just taking everything to one side of the equation, pulling out the unknown, and then solving. It's a very college algebra kind of process, even if the details are trickier. 
So if we can find an eigenvalue, we can find eigenvectors. Let me, let me, we'll come back to this, but let me state explicitly something that was true for that example and is always true. Any eigenvalue has infinite eigenvectors associated with it. So remember, eigenvalues and eigenvectors show up, you know, grouped together. It doesn't really make sense to just say that a vector is an eigenvector. You would say a vector is an eigenvector associated with some eigenvalue. And every eigenvalue has infinitely many eigenvectors associated with it. This also, this being the work we just did, gives us an alternate definition of an eigenvalue that sometimes gets used. Lambda is an eigenvalue if and only if a minus lambda i times v equals zero has non trivial solutions. And those non trivial solutions. are the eigenvectors. We're going to come back to that. For now, we're going to state a sort of smattering of basically unrelated theorems, except that, of course, they all involve eigenvalues and eigenvectors, so they're related in that sense. Theorem. If A is triangle, the eigenvalues of A are the diagonal elements. And when you state this theorem, it doesn't, it doesn't sound very interesting. Like, one of those theorems that you state once and then never think about again, just because it's in the textbook, or maybe a theorem that's used to, as a corollary to prove something. This theorem is actually 
super important. I've made the observation that finding eigenvalues by hand is usually not feasible, especially if the matrix is a large matrix. You need to use some kind of computer algebra system to numerically estimate the eigenvalues. This theorem is the heart of one of the major eigenvalue estimation algorithms. So, I mean, it's true that this is not a numerical linear algebra course. We won't go through the algorithm in depth, but this theorem does have extremely important consequences. And notice, by the way, I mentioned this earlier. Eigenvectors can't be zero. Eigenvalues can be. Zero is a diagonal element of this upper triangular matrix. So zero is an eigenvalue. That brings us very neatly to the next theorem. A has zero as an eigenvalue if and only if A is a singular, which in case we've forgotten what that means, we can remind ourselves A is singular if it has no so, this matrix does not have an inverse. No need to mess around with setting up augmented matrices and performing Gauss-Jordan elimination. It's got zero as an eigenvalue, so it cannot be invertible. Another major theorem, a matrix can have multiple eigenvalues. No reason it shouldn't. So suppose we have some square matrix A, and suppose this matrix has a bunch of eigenvalues. Every eigenvalue has eigenvectors. In fact, Every eigenvalue has an infinite number of eigenvectors. But suppose you take that first eigenvalue and you find an eigenvector. And you take that second eigenvalue and you find an eigenvector and so on down the line, then this set of vectors is linearly independent. 
different eigenvalues give independent eigenvectors. And that is a major theorem that we'll come back to. I mean, all of these theorems have been actually pretty major, but this one especially is going to sort of keep coming back up. Are there quests? I know I just sort of hit the ground and kept going. Does anybody have any questions about the material so far? Then one last definition before we, this section comes to an end. We'll keep going right into the next section as far as the lecture goes. The eigenspace of a matrix. Well, it's Or rather, suddenly paralyzed eigenspaces. The matrices have eigenspaces, or is it individual eigenvalues that have eigenspaces? Suddenly, this very elementary fact is just totally escaping me. It's eigenvalues. So you have an eigenvalue of a matrix. The eigenspace is the span of the eigenvectors of, that is to say, associated with that eigenvalue. And the key observation here. And now that I think about this observation, it should have made it obvious from the start that I was talking about eigenvalues here. Um, all the vectors in the eigenspace are eigenvectors with with the one exception um, zero is in the eigenspace. We've defined the zero vector never to be an eigenvector. So other than that, though, um, the vectors in the eigenspace are eigenvectors. And we sort of back here. I mean, this is a kind of trivial example because there's only this one independent eigenvector, but the eigenspace in this case is just all of the multiples of that eigenvector, all of the multiples of two 
squad. That brings us to the end of this section, not to the class. I will